Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. On October 3rd, 1990, the reunification of Germany went into effect. This was three years after the famous Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall speech by U.S. President Ronald Reagan. This week's guest ventured past that wall after it was opened, as his photojournalist job took him all over the world. However, it was a couple of months before this reunification when he took a photo under an overpass that would change his life in a way he could have never imagined. And to keep with the theme of this show, it all revolved around someone connected to the NFL. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time when we step off the DeLorean, it is June of 1990. And we're in an abandoned homeless camp under the Interstate 10 overpass near Carrollton Avenue in the city of New Orleans. You know, it's kind of warm out there. It's summer. It's hot. It's New Orleans. So why would we be here? Well, it's simple. We've taken an assignment to hold the camera bag for local legend Ted Jackson, a photojournalist from the Times Picune. He's about to snap a photo that would change the course of countless lives. Now, this is a story more than 30 years in the making, and in September of 2020, in the middle of all this chaos in the world, the story aired on the Today Show with Al Roker interviewing Ted Jackson and Jackie Wallace to talk about a book titled, You Ought to Do a Story on Me. Well, we'll get into this a little bit more in the interview, but first, let me tell you a little bit about a guest. Ted Jackson is a photojournalist and writer based in New Orleans. He was born in Macomb, Mississippi in 1956 and is a graduate of the University of Southern Mississippi. He joined the staff of the Times-Picune in 1984. Ted has covered many heart-stopping moments around the world, and for the purpose of this show, he wrote a book that is more than 30 years in the making titled, You Want to Do a Story on Me, which is a chronicle of his experiences with NFL legend Jackie Wallace. A quote from his website sums up the book, and it goes as such. Every few years a story comes along that pierces the national consciousness and begs new questions of our place in the world. To pick up your copy of the book, you can head over to the website. The direct link is sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash Ted Jackson. That's one word. Again, sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash Ted Jackson. Speaking of the website, and the Football History Dude podcast, if you're a longtime listener of the show, or even if you heard a couple episodes, you probably know that we have a DeLorean question for each guest that we bring on. Simply that's because, you know, I'm a big Back to the Future fan. And speaking of Back to the Future, the third installment hit theaters just a few weeks before Ted found Jackie in that overpass. I love Back to the Future movies, and just movies in general. I love to see the stories unfold, or even the experience of going to the movie theater. Can't do that as much nowadays, but I always think back to all those types of movies that I've watched. And that's why I'm proud to announce the sponsor for this week's episode. It's a movie that I personally endorse as I found it to be just an awesome adventure, something of epic proportions, we could say. Well, here's a quick rundown of the movie. Gerard Butler, Marina Baccarin, and Scott Glenn star in the Rotten Tomatoes certified fresh pulse-pounding disaster thriller Greenland when a planet-killing comet races towards Earth, 
A father and his family make a perilous journey to their only hope for sanctuary while encountering the best and worst in humanity as a countdown to global apocalypse reaches zero. Own Greenland today on digital Blu-ray and DVD, which includes deleted scenes, feature commentary with director Rick Romanois, and much more. Again, it's a great movie. If you want a copy, you better believe we have links over on the website. For the next couple of weeks, well, we'll be giving some of those copies of the movie away to some lucky winners. So all you have to do to check it out, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash contest. And I have not brought this up in a while, but if you have not subscribed for free to this podcast yet, what are you doing? You got to head over and mash that little subscribe button, your podcast player of choice, so you get the hottest, freshest off the press episodes well, every other week. But for now, let's tap on that flex capacitor and throw 1.21 gigawatts at this bad boy and get into the interview with Ted Jackson. Back there. That was from Katrina, though, right? That The one in the back? Okay. And I see you've had like a, what's the best way? A very wide ranging, a career covering a lot of different topics, it seemed like throughout the, when I was going through your website. Well, as, as photojournalists, um, I, I kind of call us the the um, Swiss Army knife of the newsroom. We just do everything. And, um, you know, everybody has their specialty. And mine has always been kind of social issues. Uh, but I've loved sports. It's always been a lot of fun to cover sports. And so Super Bowls have always been uh, kind of a highlight uh, of mine. And, of course, getting to cover the, the Saints in Miami for their Super Bowl was a, was one of the highlights of my career. One, one of the highlights. Right, for sure. So that's one of the things I wanted to get into later because I saw, I don't remember which website it was on, but I saw you with an NFL logo on a, it looked like it was a sideline. I was going to ask if you ever actually were on the sidelines photography or was it just in the stands? It was almost always on the sidelines. Yeah. Oh man. Um, we're going to dig fact, into some of that. <laughs> I can count on one hand, probably the times I've just attended NFL games uh, and it, it, and it, it feels very awkward to me <laughs> to, to be in the stands. Yeah. I mean, it's got to be a different view. Like you're looking at it through the lens versus, um, I talked to Joe Horrigan's son and his, he, he worked with NFL network a little bit, but he wasn't necessarily the cameraman on the sidelines. And he described how talented he, th- he, of course, maybe we're biased, but with, he thinks the NFL films crew and the NFL cameramen for the, the sport are better than any other sport out there. Cause it's that anticipation. So let's just jump into that. Like, how do you anticipate where you're going to get a shot for a football game? Well, it's very difficult, and it, it's good to know football, and uh, it's good to uh, be in the head of the quarterback, which I am not. <laughs> I um, I grew up loving football, and my uh, my younger brother is a coach in uh, baseball, and has coached football also. And uh, so, if I if I could have him at my side all the time, I could I would be a better photographer with uh with sports and football in particular but my specialty has always been um the human side of the uh the sport and um you know if 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 i can get the action the peak action the hit the the catch the the moment uh that was that was pretty awesome uh but i always paid attention after the catch too and to watch those little moments that happen that most people uh, uh, don't even see happen. And I don't mean other photographers. I mean the, the fans uh, don't see those little moments. Um, that's what I always enjoyed about sports. But, yeah, being, being able to anticipate is, uh, is critical, is really good, and being able to move quick and uh, to swing those huge lenses uh, from side to side quickly and to, to be able to refocus quickly. Yeah, I find it. Uh, so I have a camera that's better than I guess you could say the average, but I always put it on that sports lens because I know nothing about cameras. So I know I'm doing an injustice talking to somebody <laughs> like you as far as taking photographs. But uh, you you mentioned something about like the human aspect and maybe because it's so like in the w- w- I'm watching on TV. Right. And like you said, like they'll cut away to a commercial, they'll cut away to the sidelines or into the booth. You don't get to see necessarily everything except for the touchdown celebrations and maybe that guy going first down, but you don't see, like you said, maybe some of the other things. And do you ever catch maybe on the sidelines photographs or special moments and things like that? Uh, yeah. And um, um, if you're not a, 
Have you ever heard of the Benson Boogie? No, no. It's a, <laughs> it's, a it's legend here in New Orleans. It's the the team owner is Tom Benson, who recently passed away a few years ago, and um, there was a dance that he did at the uh, the whenever the Saints won, he'd dance around with an umbrella, which is you know kind of iconic here in New Orleans with second lining and and the jazz and that kind of thing uh, to second line. And uh, I photographed him on the sidelines when he thought the game was over, but there were a few seconds left and the Saints had just scored. And he thought the game was over and he started twirling on the sidelines in a dance with his arms out like this. And um, I made the picture with a wide angle lens with the game in the background is, you know, kind of a nice picture. They used it on the front page the next day and the tagline on top of the picture, uh, one of the really creative headline writers at the paper called it the Benson Boogie. And, oh, uh, okay. So that was tagged through a that's photo where that you the had name came from. Yeah, and and after that, it became his thing. Uh, when they won, he would he would dance, and it it really became legend. At the end of the game, he would dance around the entire, um, you know, uh, circumference of the stadium with everybody cheering him. So look it up. You'll find a lot of pictures of the Benson Boogie. I'm going to have to take a look at that. And that kind of <laughs> brings me to, so we talk about the owner and with, again, going back to the the uh, photo of Katrina back there. You, you So you must have been involved then during that, uh, the rebuilding and bringing in Drew Brees and then just the Saints and the March. I mean, like, what did that mean to the city being someone that was from there? Well, you know, it was, it was tough. Katrina was tough on everybody who lived here. And um, I always say if, if you um, if you lived here during Katrina, whether you evacuated or you stayed, you, you you had a story to tell, and it was always dramatic, no matter who you were. And um, of course, the the picture behind me is a is a survivor named uh, Robert Green, whose uh, whose mother's house was um, right in the breach of one of the major breaks in the Lower Ninth Ward, and. Um, that that night, uh, he lost his granddaughter and his mother during the storm, and um, he, he's a real survivor. And um, I um, I think I think the world of Robert, but that was kind of an iconic picture from Katrina. But you know, coming back, um, most people know the story of Steve Gleason who blocked a punt in the first game back in the Superdome for the Saints in the first few minutes of the game against Atlanta. And um, Steve, who suffers now with ALS, became a hero that night. He became a, um, an icon himself. And um, there's a statue outside the Superdome of Steve blocking that punt. Uh, I was on the wrong end of the field to get that picture. <laughs> But my uh, my colleague Michael Demacher shot the the famous picture of that block, which became the statue. Uh, but that, you know, sports people understand what sports mean to to the city and to the lifeblood and to emotions and all those kinds of things, especially during hard times. But that moment of Steve blocking that punt brought the city's spirit back, and. Um, it's just hard to describe what that was like that night. But yeah, Katrina dealt a brutal blow, something that nobody really expected from a hurricane in the city. And uh, it took a long time to, to rebuild after that. And in a lot of ways, uh, we're still rebuilding, especially in our minds, because, um, you know, there was a lot of people had uh, PTSD after that. Yeah, I I thankfully have never been directly impacted by natural events or even kind of when you talk about sports and bringing a city back, I think, of course, to 9-11 and just what sports, like you said, it people outside of it might not understand what it can give to a city or a people's, but it really does. It helps bring it together and that camaraderie and everything. And it just, I got chills here thinking about Katrina, even though I personally wasn't there and I was at that age of a, so I, I would have been probably, was that 2004 when that happened or was it? 2000, okay. So I would have been barely out of high school at the age where when you're not in it, you don't really think about the impact that it causes and that kind of thing. And it just, 
thinking about what people had to go through. And then, like you said, with that black punt, granted, it's in a green scheme of an entire season, it's not the biggest deal, but it sparked the revolution, whatever you want to call it. And then it was hard to not root for the Saints being, I am i don't know if you can see my shirt here, but I'm a Lions fan. So it's, <laughs> even though the one year in the playoffs, we don't need to talk about any of that stuff, but it's just hard. It was, it was easy to be able to root for the team because of what it meant beyond the game of football at that time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you, so this, <laughs> this really got me into a lot. I, I wanted to start off. We wanted to talk about the Jackie Wallace story and looking for and searching for him. But man, I, I didn't realize you had even more in depth as far as the NFL goes. Uh, let's, let's go back to that then. Um, what, what has a photo photojournalist and you're taking a picture and you're going to, it's something that can, as they say, a photo's worth a thousand words. What does a photo mean to you? from your lens versus somebody that's viewing it? Well, first of all, a photo- you know, when I was young looking at photographs and famous photographs like Iwo Jima and, you know, um, uh, storming the beaches in Normandy and, and uh, famous images from the Civil War, it never dawned on me as a child or as a young adult uh, that a photographer had to live that moment in order to shoot that picture. And, um, and when I started thinking about that, I, I gained a lot of respect for the photographers. And when I decided I wanted to be one, I, I realized that it was going to take an emotional toll to be able to shoot some of the pictures that I wanted to shoot. And um, so I think that's the biggest thing that a lot of people don't grasp is, uh, is uh, the stories behind the photos. And what it takes to get them. I remember when I first picked up a camera, and I, I, um, I was, of course, most young photographers look at National Geographic and think, you know, that's what I want to do for a living. And they look at the pictures, and they know exposure-wise and framing and focusing, I could shoot that picture. You know, I, I could do that. I could shoot that. I could have shot that. And uh, but I think what most people don't realize, especially what I didn't realize, is that shooting the picture is the easy part, is getting in position and knowing what picture to shoot, knowing where to be and why you're going to be there. That's the difficult part. The, the education involved in, uh, in being a really um, seasoned photojournalist, you know, it's, it, it, it takes a lot to, uh, to, to, to learn all that uh, and to... To experience those moments, it's like a, a lot of people talk about how journalists and specifically photographers get to be on the front row of history. And um, so that's a that's a benefit to this job, too, is being able to to have the access to moments that most people will only see in the newspaper or in magazines. That's a good point to tie it back into football. I mean, there's. There's plenty of athletes that are out there that, from a physical perspective, that they're just as like Brady's not the best. Okay, so let's, I don't like the term goat necessarily because it's so impossible to go from era to era, but let's just call Brady the goat right now, right? Physically speaking, he's not the greatest of all time as far as a quarterback goes. It's those intangibles and I guess similar to what you're you're describing there, you have to put yourself uh, through all these r- rigorous types of things from the mentalist perspective, and he does too. And that's why at age, I don't know, was he was running with the dinosaurs, I think, and now he's playing against uh, Green Bay here in a couple of days, and he just is able to do that. And I I was going through going back to your website, getting in the moment. I saw. Okay, there's the Cuba photos I saw. Um, I didn't see any of the, the the Berlin Wall, but I thought I saw. So were you actually there when the Berlin Wall opened up? Because I thought it said a story that you were there. Yeah, there, I was. Um, the day the Berlin Wall came down is the day that my editors decided that I needed to go, and so I wasn't there when it when it fell. But um, the the idea that my editor had and the writer had. Uh, Jim Ames. The, the writer was a, a assistant editor at the time, uh, had the idea to go beyond the wall. Now that the wall came down, we would go into East Germany and see what we had been missing 
for all these years that it blossomed them up. And uh, Jim grew up in Berlin and in Germany and different areas over there. So he spoke fluent German and um, was able to um, maneuver in that world. And um, of course, I was the beneficiary of all that. But yeah, we we were, we were, we traveled for two weeks in East Germany uh, right after the wall came down, which was an incredible experience. Yeah, that must have been a wave of emotions. I mean, for someone like you, but even more so for your partner there to go through that. And how now how long had he lived in that era before he moved over here? Well, he grew up there as a child. His dad was in the shipping business and, and I guess his formative junior high, high school years, he was there. So he, he learned the language well, learned the, the environment, but he had never been to East Germany either. Um, but um, yeah, it was, it was, it was quite a trip. Matter of fact, um, there was, there was one family who was very hesitant to let me shoot their picture. And, um, but he acquiesced and, um, I, I love this. It's a crazy little story. Uh, we got, we went back 10 years later to see how Germany had changed. East Germany had changed after the wall came down and we got to visit with a lot of the same people 10 years later. And this, this one family, this one man told me that he didn't want me to shoot his picture because he thought Jim and I were both spies for the Stasi. Because everything we said and did matched the way the Stasi worked. We asked endless questions. I shot pictures of everything. We both had trench coats that we wore. Jim said he was American, but he spoke flawless German. And um, I, we remember one time when we asked him to take him take us to his place of employment, and um, he uh, hesitated but finally acquiesced. And he said, "You remember when we got into the car, and I asked you to give me a minute? I, I forgot something in the house." And he ran back inside, and came back, and then took us to his workplace. He said. I was so convinced that you were spies and were there to take me back um, to, to prison. Uh, he said, I went into the house to tell my family goodbye. And, uh, so, you know, it's, it's just an incredible world that we were living in at that time that, that we were experiencing uh, with the people who live there. Yeah. I mean, that's just one of the stories that, like you said, the incredible uh, it's easy for us to take things for granted in the situations that I'm in, like personally me in my life, it's nothing compared to that. And then I seen going through again, the Cuba, there was this one photo and <laughs> I don't know, maybe this ties into the, we can get into the Jackie Wallace story why I brought you on here, but there was a child trying to wrestle. It was like a rope. It was that a cow or a goat. It was hard to see the picture, but an animal that was obviously bigger than the kid. Right. It was a goat. Okay, so it was a goat. They were trying to wrestle it. And it almost made me think of how many stories in our lives go that that rope was like such a fine line between victory and defeat. If all that kid had to do was let it go, but then once you let it go, now everything's gone versus the other fight in the struggle. And that's kind of the struggle that I wanted to kind of start this, this episode off with with Jackie Wallace was – all you got to do is let it go, but then it's gone and these kinds of things. So let's take us back to June 1990 and let's get us in that mood right there. Okay. Well, I was, uh, I was in the uh, newsroom. Um, um, it was a hot day and I remember um, not much was going on that day. So I was, I was in the dark room making some prints and my editor, um, my photo editor, Kurt Mutchler came into the dark room and, and said he had an idea for me saw that I wasn't doing anything. And uh, so he, he said um, he had noticed a homeless camp over the weekend. And uh, it was right when you, you take off through an exit off Carrollton Avenue in New Orleans, headed towards Metairie. He said, when you come off that ramp, look to the right, and there you'll see a homeless camp. And um, I asked him, you know, what's, what's so special about it? And, he said it's set up like a living room. So couches and chairs and a table and all these things. So that was all I needed. You know, it was just we, we like different, you know, in journalism. And, and um, so I, I thought it'd be interesting to, to see what these guys were up to in this little camp. So, so I headed over there 
when I got to the camp, um, it was all turned upside down. There was nobody around. It looked like it had been ransacked. And, um, but you know, nobody expected anything out of the story. It was just, uh, go check it out, see if it makes something. And so I really wasn't disappointed, but you know, I kind of ramped my mind up a little bit. So I headed back to the car and about a hundred yards away or so, I just came up on this one solitary man sleeping on a rusty box spring. And he was wrapped in a clear plastic sheet. And it startled me, you know, but I just didn't expect anybody to be there kind of tucked away on the edge there. And, um, so his camp was unique looking because it was so neat. It was, um, uh, he had his shoes lined up, socks tucked in, his clothes folded on a five gallon, you know, uh, bucket, um, or milk crates, that kind of thing. And uh, he had a newspaper neatly folded at his side. And so I'm not going to do anything with this, but it's a neat picture. And so I climbed up on a cross beam and shot straight down with the wide angle lens and made a picture. Uh, like I said, I didn't think I'd do anything with that. But, but I um, climbed down and I woke him up to ask him if he knew anything about the camp. And he, um, he was groggy, kind of wiped the sleep out of his eyes and sat up. And, and, uh, he told me what had happened. He said he, uh, he understood that some guys were teenagers were coming down that exit ramp and they were shooting guns into the camp and, and ran them off. That's what happened. But then he said, why do you want to know? And I said, well, I worked for the times Picayune. I had two cameras on a big camera bag with, full of lenses and stuff. And, and uh, so I was wanting to do a story about homelessness and, and um, he kind of hesitated for a second. And then he said, you ought to do a story about me. And uh, which turns out to be the title of the book. And I said, why? And he said, because I've played in three Super Bowls. And now he had my attention. And uh, so I, um, I didn't believe it. I thought he was a little delusional or, or something like that. And, and so I asked him what his name was and he told me Jackie Wallace. It still didn't mean anything to me because I didn't grow up in New Orleans. I grew up in Mississippi and, and, um, uh, I was not a roster kind of a guy to begin with. So, um, he showed me an ID. Yep. There it was Jackie Wallace. Okay. Well, you know, I thanked him, so I headed on back to the office. So I probably drove a little too fast because this was this was pretty weird. And so I, I drove back to the office and um, I pretty much trotted or ran through the newsroom to the sports department. I passed my photo editor <laughs> on the side going and um, headed to the sports department, and the sports editor um, answered my question. I said, does anybody know who a guy named Jackie Wallace? And every head popped up. And Tim Ellery was the editor. He, he started explaining who Jackie was, that he had been this star, a legend quarterback at St. Aug High School. And he went to Arizona, and they made a great quarterback out of him and um, switched him from offense to defense. And he became a great punt returner and made All-American. And he was drafted with the Vikings, played with the Colts, and played with the Rams, and and actually played in two Super Bowls, not three, like he said. But he had been on the team for three. And so that's what he meant by that. So, but then Tim said, but nobody knows where he is anymore. And I just, I was about to bust. I said, you won't believe it, but I think I found him. This is the interesting part to me. Well, besides all that's pretty interesting, but mm -hmm. another interesting little detail is that the newspaper that was laying next to Jackie while he was sleeping was the Times Picayune, that day's edition, and it was open and folded open to the sports page. And 
that day was the third part of a three-part series on NFL heroes, where are they today? And that day, the installment was Joe Ehrman with Baltimore Colts, who had uh, retired from football and transitioned into a, a gospel minister. At that time in the sports department, Jimmy Smith, who had written that three-part series, was standing next to me. And now this just falls into place, you know. And uh, so Jimmy says, do you think he's still there? Do you think you got the name right? And I said, yeah, I've got it written down right here. It's Jackie Wallace. And he said, you think he's still there? And I said, I hope so. So we went running back. And sure enough, he was right where I left him. And uh, the interesting thing to me is that Joe Ehrman, who was in the paper that day, was an old friend of Jackie's. They had played together as teammates in Baltimore. Hey, hey, it's halftime, which means it's time to share with you a promo from a podcast on the Sports History Network, the headquarters for your favorite sports yesteryear. Welcome to History of College Football Podcast. I am Jay Abramson, and I will take you down a gridiron memory lane. The national champions, the teams, the rivalries, the conferences, the Heisman winners, the rankings. Today, we will discuss the college football history of the Alabama Crimson Tide. This is how many of our podcasts begin. Now, I may supplant the last line with, we're lucky to have a very special guest, Mr. Chris Willis, head of Research Library at NFL Films. See, the History of College Football podcast is dedicated to preserving the memory of this sport the American public has collectively loved since 1869. We have new podcasts every Tuesday and Saturday. Often, we dedicate a podcast to the college football history of a particular school. We chronicle the program, encapsulate where the program fits into the grand historical spectrum of college football. I find each school's lineage uniquely fascinating, and we explore the program's peak performances, unusual occurrences, and its share of heartbreak. We cover the team's first season, national championships, Heisman winners, legendary coaches, most stunning wins, heartbreaking losses, best teams, all-time great players, and the extra hullabaloo that makes that program unique. And we never forget to discuss the mascot. We also have special interest podcasts as well that range in scope, such as the top 10 reasons to love HBCU football, or special guests ranging from radio talk show personalities to Emmy-nominated producers. So come and listen. I am Jay Abramson, host of the History of College Football podcast. Join us every Tuesday and Saturday for a new episode. So I realized after looking at it, you know, looking back at it, that uh, Jackie went to sleep reading about his buddy in uh, the Baltimore Colts. And um, when he woke up, he had a journalist standing over him. So it was natural for him to say, uh, you know, you ought to do a story about me because he had a story to tell, too. A very different one, but he had a story to tell. And um, so it was interesting that um, that was on a Tuesday. Uh, The next day was the 4th of July. I spent it with my family in Mississippi. And then on Thursday, I came back, spent an entire day with Jackie and um, turned my pictures in late that night. And the story ran on the front page the next morning on Friday. And by Friday afternoon, Jackie's old teammates from St. Aug had rescued him out from under the bridge, you know, exactly where the newspaper said he was. They went and, and found him. And um, they put him up at the school in the um, in the priest quarters over the the weekend. They fed him, they clothed him, and they uh, and they housed him. And by Monday, he was on a plane with Burton Burns, who is you may know is uh, the, the the great running backs quote running backs coach with uh, Nick Saban in Alabama. He's now running backs coach with the New York Giants. And, um, but he was a teammate of Jackie's in high school and he was now assistant coach with, uh, St. Aug. And, uh, Burton, uh, escorted Jackie to Baltimore to a rehab clinic where he got clean and sober and, uh, got his life back together. And, uh, one of my favorite parts of the story is, is happened three years after that. And I'm back in the newsroom, um, you know, working on some captions for another story. And um, there's a tap on the window right above my desk, which leads to the newsroom. 
And uh, it was that pop, 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 you know. And I, I looked up, and there was Jackie. He was standing there in a three-piece suit. He had his arms out as wide as he was tall, which is six foot three. He has always had a gap tooth grin, and he was grinning from ear to ear. And he said, "You do you believe in miracles?" And uh, he had charmed his way into the newsroom to invite me to his wedding. And um, and Jimmy wrote the story. He was there to invite both of us to the wedding. As a matter of fact, I just came across that wedding invitation. <laughs> <laughs> that he gave me that day. And, um, but, um, we didn't get to go to the wedding, but, uh, uh, we did go a short time later to do a follow up story. And we got to meet his wife, got to see their new house, where he lived, where he worked, was working on the changeover crew at the Baltimore Arena. And, um, I remember him taking me to his locker room where he had, uh, uh, his personal things that, um, you know, when you change clothes and things, but he opened up the locker and he pulled out a folder, uh, of the, the photos and the newspaper that, that, uh, had been published years before. And, um, he said, I have to look at these pictures every day or I'll end up right back where you found me. And, uh, so it was a remarkable success story is the way we look back on it now. And uh, of how all that came together just because we met under the bridge that day. Yeah, offer to grab a photo. And you said that, or I would end up this way again if I didn't see a photo. Why, why, why did he say that? Well, i show you the picture here. He said he just had to remind himself of, uh, of where he was. And, uh, of course, you can see the, the newspaper here. And, uh, but he, he, he um, he had copies of all these photos, and um, he said he just needed to be reminded of how he, how far he had fallen, and how quickly he got there. And um, he had learned in Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous that um, every day was a challenge. That uh, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic, and of course, a crack addict which was his situation. And uh, so he just knew that, that he had to watch every step and that he couldn't fall because that's all it would take is just one mistake. And um, that was, that's hard for me to understand. In all this time, knowing Jackie now for 30 something years, I've really come to understand how tenuous that success is. Uh, and we tend to look at the failure of an addict and not his success. And when I think of Jackie being clean and sober for seven, eight, nine years at a time, what remarkable strength that takes. And for him to fall, which he eventually did in Baltimore after, um, let's see, I found him in 1990. He, um, he, he, um, was again addicted and back on the streets and, 2002. And um, so to, to realize that it only took one failure to put him back on the streets again. Uh, it's remarkable to be able to hold out that long, especially when I realized that we all have addictions. Um, I sat down with them when I, when I was writing the book, I sat down with a, the chaplain at one of the homeless shelters here in New Orleans and I asked him to describe what it, a, what it was to be addicted and to, to rehab from it. Because I said, I've, I've never been addicted to anything. And he looked at me very sternly and said, Oh, really? <laughs> he said, really? He said, uh, check your closet, uh, because we're all addicted to something. But my addictions don't put me under a bridge sleeping or it doesn't put me in jail or it doesn't um, cause my friends in my family to walk away from me uh, because my addiction is my cell phone or it's drinking too many Cokes or having too much sugar. Um, I mean, I, I could, I could list probably a, um, probably about 12 things that I struggle with, but none of them are socially unacceptable. 
Matter of fact, most of those addictions are encouraged by media and advertisements and, you know, multi-million dollar campaigns to get me to use more Coke, you know, kind of thing. Um, so when, when I came to understand that about Jackie, I, I started having a whole lot more compassion for him. Um, as, as an addict, someone who was struggling because I started linking his successes on a daily basis instead of his failures. I mean, going back to that photo I talked about in Cuba with that child yeah. and holding onto that goat. I mean, it, that's a lot of strength to be able to, if that child tried to try to hold on that goat for 10 years, you're however it long was in between Jackie's and boom, it's gone. That's right. It just hap- happens that quick. Uh, so you said you've known him for 30 some odd years uh, and, and there's a couple of different times where you've lost him. How did that process go when you say I lost him? Well, after we visited in Baltimore, uh, Jackie developed this, uh, this habit of calling every year at Thanksgiving and Thanksgiving morning. I remember the first time it came, uh, you know, at, we usually go from here in New Orleans area to Mississippi to spend the day with family, usually my brother's houses or my mom's house. And um, usually my brother would call and, and rib me about, you know, are you, are you bringing the food we ask you to bring? Do you have it ready? Are you going to be on time or are we going to have to wait for, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but when the phone rang this time, it was, it was not my brother. It was, it was Jackie and it surprised me. And, um, but he said, um, you know, he's, he's, he said, this is what makes Thanksgiving real to me is to be able to thank the people who are important to me in my life. And, um, and that started the yearly tradition and he never missed a Thanksgiving. And, um, he would call Jimmy Smith and he would call me. And, um, it was, it was very special for me because now that's part of what made the day special for me too. Um, but after many years, the phone call didn't come and I didn't think much about it at first because people change, move on, maybe forgot, you know, whatever. And, uh, but the next year it didn't come either. And then I, I got concerned. Uh, so I called Jimmy and asked him if he got the call and he said, no. And, uh, so we wondered what had happened. So Jimmy called the home phone, his wife answered and she told him what had happened that he had, disappeared again and she didn't know where he was and that was crushing and it was um I, as i write in the book it, it's you know i kind of wrestle with my own uh, my own heart at times of you know why it was crushing for me you know was it because i was so upset that jackie had fallen again or was it because i had now lost the big success in my career that this was a crowning moment for my uh, photojournalism was to be able to shape a, um, you know, a, a life in this way to, to help someone in such a dramatic way. And, uh, so I wrestled with that a lot. You know, why did it upset me so much? So I, I started looking for him. I had no reason to think he came back to New Orleans other than this is where he was before. This is where he grew up. Um, this is a place he knew, but I didn't have any idea he was here. So, so I didn't make any special efforts, but I did start looking on the street corners when the guy standing there with the sign, you know, I'll work for food or whatever it was, you know, that, uh, I'd look deeply at the face whenever I did a, a homeless story. Whenever I went to a, a shelter, I would look for him. I would ask about him, pass his name around the directors, the other guys on the street and, at first, people knew who he was, but hadn't seen him. Uh, one time, one of the directors at the Osman Inn told me that he thought he had gone to jail. But that was about all there was to it. But about four years ago, it really started bothering me. that uh, I, I went to a shelter one night for a story for the paper where... Uh, a reporter and myself spent the night and we went through the intake just like the guys would and uh, asked the, you know, a- answered the embarrassing questions and, and turned our gear in, all that kind of stuff and slept on the beds, ate the food. Just like every time before I asked people if they had seen my old friend, Jackie, 
this time it was different because this time nobody even remembered the name. And um, so I figured he was dead, figured he was um, at best, you know, homeless somewhere else. Um, but that night, while I was sleeping on the cot, I, I really decided that it was time to to try to find him, to get serious about this. This was I'd kind of you know been superficial too long with it, and so I um, I made a dedicated effort after that to try to find him and, and go through every hoop I could jump through to to try to find him. So that that's where the that's that's where it started turning into a book. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Like, why did you write a book about this story? Yeah. <laughs> that kind of leads into it, I guess. <laughs> well, uh, uh, to, as, a, as a spoiler alert here, I, I did find him. It took, him a, it took a long time, but I found him again. And uh, it was an incredible moment uh, where I'd, I walked up to a front, um, the front of a house, an apartment, and I, uh, I spoke to a uh, a man sitting in a chair who d- didn't want to have anything to do with me. I asked him if, uh, if he knew my old friend and I figured he would think I was a cop. And so I carefully worded my question. I said, old friend. And he said, yeah, who is he? And I knew when I said the name, if he knew him, he would, he would react some way. And I was looking, watching the eye to see if his eye twitched because if, if he lied to me, at least his eye would twitch. Something would move. And when I said Jackie Wallace, his eye twitched. It, it really did. And he looked at me, he looked me up and down, and he said, the door on the right. And I couldn't believe it. And I was halfway to the door when the door opened. And a familiar, old, older face stuck out the door and said, what are you telling him? What are you telling that man about me? I was about halfway to him by then. I said, are you Jackie Wallace? And I knew it was, it was obvious to me. And uh, he said, who wants to know? And I said, when I tell you, you're going to smile. And when I told him my name, he broke into this, the big gap tooth grin that I knew so well and he just engulfed me in a bear hug. Now, Jackie's 6'3", and I'm 5'8", on a good day. <laughs> and uh, he swallowed me in that hug. And uh, he ushered me in the house. He wanted to show me everything. It was a um, um, kind of a halfway house where he was living. And uh, he had been clean for three years. And uh, was was in a really good recovery. He wanted to show me his bedroom. He wanted to show me all his stuff. His Jackie doesn't keep a lot of stuff, but he had a few things. He had a a team picture of the the Minnesota Vikings on his desk. He had motivational posters on his wall everywhere. Had pictures of his family. But we, I, I wasn't able to stay but about 15 minutes that day with the promise I'll be back as soon as I can get back. But I, th- I think we, he, I think we bear hugged probably five times in that 15 minutes and we shot a selfie. I sent it to my editor and I said, look who I found. And Andrew Boy is my photo editor. And he sent a text back and he said, is that Mr. Wallace? I said, yes, it is. And he said, I think you've just found your next story. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely uh, a movie worthy type of thing that you don't even, I mean, is that a spoiler alert? Is there a movie coming out that we don't know about yet? <laughs> well, if you know, let me know. <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, I mean, it definitely is a story that, so I was, I, do, I have not been able to read the book yet, but I read through the article on your website and this, I'll just totally candid because this is a different type of podcast. It's about the history of the NFL. I didn't know what way to take it, how it was going to go, but I knew it's a story that had to be told to the listeners of the show. And there's going to be many listeners that are going to recognize this name. I myself didn't until I had, I had to research Mm -hmm. after seeing you on the today show, by the way, what was it like being able to talk to Al Roker? Well, 
that was awesome. But I, I'll, I'll tell you what the, the best part of that was. Honestly, the best part of it was watching Jackie Wallace talk to Al Roker. That just it just doesn't get any better than that. To to find to 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 see Jackie sleeping under a bridge, homeless, addicted to crack, and to see him thirty years later on the Today Show talking to Al Roker, that was a dream come true. Yeah, it's something that now you kind of alluded to this earlier about the struggle within of you didn't know if you were more upset that you lost a friend or if you lost a story. It kind of makes me think about NFL players or coaches that are near the end of their career, let's say, and or like even you as a photographer, how do you go from having that story that is a once in a lifetime story to then covering, I don't want to say insignificant because that's an unfair word to put it, but it, how do you ever match that crowning achievement, but still put in that same kind of passion or however you want to word it? Well, I mean, you never know what's coming next. You never know what's around the corner. And uh, um, yeah, someone asked me one time if the um, if Hurricane Katrina was the story of my life, of my career, uh, the, the, the most dramatic thing that I would ever cover. And um, I remember saying, I hope so, because I can't take anything more dramatic than this, you know. Uh, but yeah, there, there's been a lot of stories like that. Matter of fact, the, 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 the original idea of the book, uh, was the, 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 the 12 people who I've met in my career that inspired me. And Jackie was one chapter. And, uh, an, a, a New York agent, um, suggested, um, uh, that I, that I, that the book was about Jackie. Jackie was the book. And maybe some of these others is the, the next book, but, uh, but yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of memories. There's a lot of incidences and situations and opportunities and serendipities that have that happened through a 30, 35, 36 year career, um, that are just profound in this profession, uh, for me. But, but Jackie is, um, is a, is a unique story. Not just because, and here's the thing. Jackie's not a unique story in that. He's a football player that played in the Super Bowl that ended up addicted to crack. That that can be written probably a hundred times in the NFL. Uh, what makes Jackie unique is that he was determined to get his life back. And when he did, he would often find himself in failure again. But yet he was once again determined to get his life back. And that's why on the, on the, the cover of the book, it, it mentions, you know, uh, um, you know, addiction, uh, unlikely friendship and the endless quest for redemption. And, uh, that is Jackie. Jackie has a spirit like none I have ever seen. He's just, he's charming. And I don't mean the kind of charming of an addict trying to manipulate you. I mean, he is just a charming human being who just smiles, sees the positive in everything, and sees opportunities and uh, lets the bad days roll off his back. And he, he, if you, if you give Jackie a hundred dollars, he'll have it given away by the next day trying to help someone else. And, um, I don't know too many people like that. And so people have always wanted to help Jackie. But the problem is that so many people are so easily frustrated with with uh, someone in an addiction that as soon as they make a mistake again, they give up on that person. And uh, I think that's one of the lessons of the book is that uh, you know Jackie wanted to to succeed, and uh, he just needed more help than most. Now, the most important question: How is Jackie doing today? He's doing great. He's doing great. What's the day? Today is Friday. Uh, I saw him two days ago. And um, um, I think we talked about, f we got to visit for about 45 minutes. And uh, he's just same as always. He's just optimistic. He, he has, Jackie has NFL hips. He's had two hip replacements now. He struggles with his mobility. But he, every time I say, how you doing? He said, Oh, we're getting better. We're getting better. 
tomorrow's going to be a better day, you know, kind of thing. And uh, it's it, it, it truly is remarkable. I thought I saw also that whether it was from your article or maybe that was just a part of it, but it kind of sparked a revolution in NFL retired players' improvements. I mean, was that something that came up from this? It is. Matter of fact, it came from the original story in 1990 that there were only two teams. Uh, the The Broncos were one of them. I'm trying to remember the second one that had any kind of programs to help former players, to help players transition back to real, to the real world. Um, I mean, you know, any sports hero or any, any, some, anybody that is so skilled, um, in their job or their career, their talents or something, you know, that they, they didn't just develop that when they were 20 years old. They, they were born with a certain amount of that, uh, skills, talents, um, uh, achievements and things. And they're cursed with, um, being filled with adulation from childhood. You know, you're the greatest, you're the greatest. No one's ever been like you, you know, you're the best and you're the best. And, you know, you think about it, they, they hear that every day and right up to the time when their career falls to the, they real let go. Yeah. Until the light <laughs> goes out and, and suddenly nobody loves them anymore. And, uh, so, you know, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's a real struggle for people like that. Yeah. I would imagine so. And then also they, they focus so much on one thing and they achieve the pinnacle of something to when it's over. Okay. What's next. And unfortunately that's what a lot of our veterans deal with too. Cause they're over there. Then they come back and, you know, that's something that I could see a guy like Jackie Wallace be like, Hey, come on over. We're, I'm going to help you out. Kind of thing. Like you said, I'm going to give you my last dime and my last, my last penny, uh, almost like, okay. Transition to a question I was going to ask. He maybe seems alien and foreign to some people. Cause how can someone that went through that still be that cheerful, but let's say an alien race came right now and you could pick one photograph of an NFL game or player, whatever it is, to explain to that alien race what the NFL football means to us as Americans. One that I've shot? Yeah, let's go with that because that's an easy <laughs> one. Um, one of my favorite sports pictures uh, that I've shot is uh, Drew Brees holding up his son at the end of the Super Bowl in Miami. That That's one of my favorite pictures. Uh, now, a lot of people have seen that picture. And uh, I don't want to take credit for anyone that you've seen because uh, uh, probably about 20, 30 people shot that picture that night. And uh, it was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. That was not mine. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it, that's one of my favorites. And it's um, in, in, in my image, I have um, Drew Brees' wife, uh, Brittany, looking up at the two of them. And she's wiping a tear from her eye. And, uh, that, that's a very special moment to me, but it, it, it's, it, that says to me that, you know, running a football down the field or, or throwing it farther than the other guy or being able to hit someone really hard transcends those physical moments into a very emotional moment. And that something, uh, speaks of legacy and heritage and, um, something that binds people together, uh, in their hearts. It rises uh, above the everyday. It, it lives in your heart forever. A lot of these moments do, just like uh, the Steve Gleason moment. We are in New Orleans. Um, those two images are probably uh, sealed in everyone's hearts as to what this team means to us. Now, the the younger generation right now don't remember how bad the Saints were for so long. But if you're older like me, then then you remember that first game and you remember that last game and a lot of years in between. Yeah, yeah. I I would like to tell you I feel bad for you, but I remember I said I'm a Lions fan. So <laughs> you don't get anything there. But speaking of living moments and being able to remember them forever, there's a question I asked to every guest of the show. I'm giving you the virtual keys to my DeLorean right now. <laughs> you can go back to any point in NFL history. You can tweak it. That's a very open-ended question, and you can relive that moment. What would it be? To relive the moment, and this this is not going to be a moment that most people will know. Um, 
the, the first thing I think of when you talk about the Lions, though, when I, I was a uh, uh, preteen, I believe, is when Tom Dempsey kicked that record field goal against the Detroit Lions. Uh, yeah, it seems like every time I see something, it's always either if it's bad, it's against the Lions. If it's good, it's, it's not the Lions. <laughs> okay, back to your question. <laughs> right, right. Let's stick with the questions, man. I remember where I was when that happened. Uh, but anyway, um, if I could go back. The um, when the Saints were in the Super Bowl in Miami, of course we've only been one time. Um, thank you, Tom Brady. But um, during that game, the Saints against the Colts, um, the first quarter was terrible for the Saints. And I'm on the sidelines. I'm on the field with my lens and with all the other photographers. I'm in the corner of an end zone. Um, and it was getting very depressing very fast. I forget the score right now, but uh, I think we were down two scores in the middle of the second quarter, I think. And I remember saying, remember, I'm not a roster guy. I'm not a uh, stats guy. But in the middle of the second quarter, I remember saying to myself, to my team, just show up. You know, you don't have to win. Just show up. Don't embarrass the city. The city needs this so bad. Just show up. And I remember just a couple minutes later, after that, that feeling, I remember in the end, in the corner of the end zone across to my left, I remember a really small chant start up. And it was the who dat chant. Who dat? Who dat? Who dat say they're going to beat those saints? And it started building and it went all around the stadium and it just got louder and louder and louder. It gave me chills. It really did. And it suddenly, I'm kind of getting emotional right now, thinking about how the, the, the fans just, it was almost like they were just praying to the players, just just show up because we believe in you. We believe in you. And of course, the rest is history. But uh, at the uh, coming back in the third quarter, that onside kick was a moment for the history books. And when the interception happened, and, and we went. We, we we actually had a moment where I I, I stopped and said, um, "It's possible. Not only did we show up, it's possible we might win this." And if you're a Saints fan, you don't count the win until that last second ticks off. I don't care how many times you've seen this script played out. Uh, we don't take a win until it's over. And uh, but I, I started to believe after that interception that it was possible that we could win. But yeah, that moment of that chant growing up, going up in that corner of the, uh, the stadium was chilling to me. I'll never forget it. Yeah, you're right. That's something that as an observer, granted, I was rooting for Peyton Manning in the Colts that, that game, by the way. Well, he's, and, uh, our, he, about, he's our boy too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, because of the neck of the wood. Yeah, for sure. But, uh, that, talk talk about a biggest Stones moment and a decision that I remember in my personal Super Bowl history uh, to come out of halftime and to kick that that uh, onside kick like that. Just of course, at the time, I'm sure, like you said, you needed to do something crazy to get back into it. I don't remember what the score was either, but it seemed like they were doomed and destined to just Peyton Manning is going to win a second Super Bowl or whatever it would have been at that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah I. I think we can all remember the different kinds of moments. And that's why I like to ask that DeLorean question, whether it's going back to your own history or going back to something that you were not a part of before. But before I let you go, as a photojournalist on the sidelines of a Saints game where you're also the fan, how was that? How do you delineate between those two and how do you break that up? I try to separate it. And um, obviously with the story about Jackie Wallace, I, I have uh, mixed those emotions a few times where, you know, a story becomes a, a friend in Jackie. 
But uh, on the sidelines, I feel like I've always been able to 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 be objective on the sidelines. But it is so much fun to watch them win. And uh, I remember the Super Bowl season. We would, uh, you know, it was it was something that was hard to believe that was actually happening. So I remember at the beginning of every game after we had won, like you know, going into eight games. A uh, member of the photographers, the local photographers, would all kind of mingle under the, you know, the field goal before the game started and say, you know, we're probably going to lose tonight, but uh, it's been a great run, hasn't it? And it just kept going every week. It just kept going. But, um, but yeah, it's, um, it, it's, it's a different feeling when it's your team and it's, um, when, when they're doing well. I remember, you know, just just on, on road games, especially, you know, you're in a, a, a the hostile stadium, and your team is doing well, and you, everybody's depressed around you, and you're just thinking, you know, we're doing it, we're doing it again, and so you know, it's it's a it's a special thing. And, and going back to Katrina, that was that was why I think it was so hard to cover it was because I've covered so many disasters, earthquakes, and hurricanes, more hurricanes than I can count. But uh, seeing that happen to my own city, to my friends and my coworkers, and 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 uh, all those kinds of things, it was a devastating feeling. And it, it's it's that way too when you have a when you have your team. Yeah, I mean, just like going back to to nine eleven, for instance, there's been way more devastation in other countries that we're kind of tone deaf too, but then when it happens here to something on our own soil or to our own team or to anything that we can localize, it means something different internally. And as a Lions fan, I would hate to see him go, but would you welcome Matthew Stafford in the impending trade whenever this happens? <laughs> oh, we, we welcome anybody that helps us. I mean, anybody. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I'm, Unfortunately, that's probably what they're going to do. But we just got your your assistant coach or assistant head. I don't know what his title was with you, Dan Campbell. He's going to be our head coach for the next, hopefully, six years because that means he's successful. That's right. That's what you want. A long tenure. (laughs) Yep. So Uh, with that, any last uh, parting words of advice or wisdom or just open total floor for the listener of the show? Oh, it's um, I'm, I'm very proud of this book. Um, it, it, it feels like, um, the culmination of not only my career, but my life in a lot of different ways, uh, to be able to share Jackie's story in a way that is touching so many people's lives. Uh, people are really responding to it. Um, they, they see, I've had so many people that, um, have told me that they picked the book up thinking that they're reading about a photographer and a football player and realize deep down that they're reading about themselves. Um, about things that they didn't know about themselves and that they, things that they, uh, they aspire to be, that they want to be. And, um, for the most part, they're not learning it from me. They're learning it from Jackie. Jackie's the one that's teaching the lessons and his spirit, his faith, his, uh, his optimism, his, um, his, um, you know, just, just his, the, the way he can inspire people to, uh, to, to push harder and to push farther. And dis- despite the obstacles. So, I mean, that's, that's just, um, thrilling for me to see people to, to get the message and to, to understand that. Um, it's very happy with it and very happy to have met Jackie. And we, we feel like that, that that moment under that bridge that day was destined by God. We both said that independently to each other one day and we were kind of stunned and we just laughed that, uh, we both felt the same about that. And um, so really appreciate you having me on and being able to talk about this story and and uh, uh, just kind of about life in general in a way. Now, how about that story? Not even just the Jackie Wallace story. I mean, Ted has been around the world. He's seen many things. And he's been able to see how humanity has been able to overcome various obstacles, just like on the field. We have the gridiron moments where it seems like you're down and out, but then the team pulls through, or vice versa. I mean, look at this last Super Bowl. I was sitting there watching Super Bowl 55, just imagining, through the majority of it, 
Mahomes is just going to come back. But then the goat, just like we talked about the goat and that rope in this episode, the rope must have been let go by Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs because the goat ran away with it. And I I hope you enjoyed it yourself, listening to this incredible story that Ted has gone on. And of course, there's way more. You got to check out his website. You got to get this book. And again, if you want to get a copy of Ted's book, you ought to do a story on me or learn more about his work or the Jackie Wallace story. Please head over to the dedicated page. You can get there through the short link at sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash Ted Jackson. And if you have not subscribed free to this podcast, and again, what are you doing? You need to go ahead. Mash that little subscribe button on your podcast player of choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest off the press episodes well, every other week. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes... Where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football, Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.